Australian uh, GU surgeon um, who was with us some time back in the department as a senior lecturer and a consultant surgeon in the North Colombo Teaching Hospital and who is well experienced in teaching the undergraduates. And, uh, and uh, my honor to welcome you, sir, back to the department uh, to teach these undergraduates. Right, right. Good evening. Good evening. The, uh, just give me a minute when this phone is ringing. I, yeah, just sure. off. I just, just switch it off, otherwise this won't work. Yeah, yeah sure. right. Yeah, good evening. Yes, I'm more than uh, happy to get involved in the teaching program. Uh, it's, it's something close to my heart and I actually miss teaching the students. So I'm here uh, to try and teach something to them. Uh, I'll if you can go through a small brief, at least the, the overall uh, talk today, and uh, so to, to just yes. But I, what I thought was first, I mean, the the practically the most important thing for a uh, a medical student is you must know uh, why do we form stones, right? And what types of stones are there, and why should we know the different types? Uh, the, the way we investigate, all that has a bearing if you know what stones have certain features. So I think that's important. Uh, once we get, uh, get that, once we've got that out of the way, it's important that we also, as doctors, be able to diagnose this very common disease, it's a very common disease, and it's a, it's a very painful condition. And it also can have an effect on, on renal function. So if you don't manage stones pro properly, you actually compromise on kidney function. So one is it's important that we treat it properly, purely from the pain aspect, symptom control. And the other one is uh, the most important thing is actually the uh, conservation of kidney function by properly treating urinary stones. Uh, we'll also go through the modalities that we have uh, from medical management to uh, shockwave lithotripsy to uh, just a little overview of uh, as surgeons what we do when we are confronted with stones that need uh, attention. Every stone does need attention and we'll just go through some of those. So that's a very important uh, point that uh, students uh, pointed out. It's not only symptomatic control or the relief of pain, but also it helps to preserve the kidney function uh, and otherwise they will end up in a renal failure. So over to you, sir, uh, sir uh, you can start now. So I, th I think the most important thing is we'll just, I'll just have a slide or two, but I don't want to run this too much. The most important thing is to. Yeah, we can see the screen, sir. See the screen, right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So the, uh, the most important thing is to, as I told you, understand why do we develop a stone? If you understand that, it becomes easy to uh, treat and uh, prevention also, you, you have an understanding. Puta, can you just get this going, this next slide? So, you must know that it's a very common problem and stones are usually found in the world in, uh, in the tropical area. So it's near the equator. It, it's what we call the stone belt. Uh, Sri Lanka, India, and it goes across Africa. And, and uh, so there's a thing called a stone belt we described because the incidence of stone disease is very common in this area. As we, I, I don't need to elaborate too much on the morbidity. The most important thing is pain and the renal uh, pr preservation of renal function by treating it properly. The, the most important thing is that you've got to understand that a stone is a precipitant. And for a precipitant to form from your A-level chemistry, you know, it's, you, you have to have a supersaturated solution. Now, 
it's it's surprising that our urine most of the time is a supersaturated solution then you must ask me why is it that all of us don't form stones we don't form stones because we have inhibitors we have biological inhibitors that prevent crystal aggregation and stops us from forming stones so these are very delicate balance where you have a supersaturated solution waiting to form precipitants but the inhibitors are stopping it from happening so any change in this dynamics causes the precipitation to occur right let's take the commonest reason if you are dehydrated the supersaturation uh, goes beyond supersaturation and you start precipitating if you add more solutes in the form of you know common things uh, hypercalcemia in diabetes you get more uric acid and the list is long but just understand the mechanism you add more solute precipitant you reduce the water content precipitation and actually the common reason research has shown in the asia region is absence or reduction of the inhibitor that is citrate pyrophosphate and tamhos for proteins so this is the commonest cause of stone formation and actually it's it's the research shows we haven't done it in sri lanka yet but uh, most research coming out of india and uh, this was in uh, uh, singapore and another country just slips my mind what you have is hypocitrate urea this is the main cause as i told you you can go through the causes from hypercalcemia hyper you know the, the list is long there's no point me just repeating that okay so now once you form a stone if you don't do anything it grows right by crystal aggregation so the trick is to try and stop it from happening so once a stone forms it obviously shows the chemicals that it is formed from and the commonest stone that we form is calcium oxalate right and you get two types calcium oxalate monohydrate which is rock hard it's like as we call in singhala the real kalugal is really hard and the other one is calcium oxalate dihydrate it's not that hard that that's what you call a jack stone you see like spikes on it it's very easy to break surgically the most interesting uh, stones are not calcium oxalate although they are common they are straight forward stones but the triple phosphate stone is the interesting one this is also called true white stone and this forms in alkaline urine you know most of the time our urine is acidic but when urine is alkaline you you get triple phosphate that's absolutely essential fact so you get uh, alkaline urine in bacterial infections uh, right and and when you have that bacterial infection happening you get these magnesium ammonium phosphate precipitating out and giving you true white stone or it will be also called infective stones so hence it is very different from the other uh, commonest one from calcium oxalate one the next interesting stone is what you call a uric acid stone now it's interesting firstly it is one of the stones that cannot be seen on x rays there no calcium in it and it's radio lucent it can be seen on ultrasound but it can't be seen on x rays uric acid stones occur commonly in the sri lankan population in diabetics because you have more uric acid in the urine you're not having hyperuricemia but you have hyperuricosuria uric acid excess in the urine and this is interesting as i told you because of the it's radio lucent it can be dissolved and it can be prevented this uh, uric acid forms in acid urine and if you make the ph beyond 
patients don't form uric acid stones. And if you have formed a uric acid stone, it goes into solution. So you can dissolve. This is the only stone in Western medicine that we can dissolve. All other stones we can't dissolve. The other thing is the cysteine stone. I put that down because that's also an example. If someone asks you an MCQ, these two stones are radiolucent, uric acid and cysteine. And this is only put because I saw one MCQ had been asked previously, indenavir. Indenavir is a, indenavir is a uh, anti-HIV medication, if you, which is given for long, long periods. When you take that, you develop a stone that, that is the only stone that cannot be seen on CT scanning, right? So hence, the, if you just remember these little bits, should be enough for exam purposes, okay? So once you have a stone developing, it usually develops in the renal uh, papilla, right? From here, it forms what is known as a Randall's plaque, a little precipitation of calcium oxalate. And this grows and falls into the renal pelvis. Most of the time, renal calculi are asymptomatic. If it blocks the calicial neck, you'll have some loin pain. Once the stone starts going down the ureter, you get colicky abdominal pain, which is unmistakable because it is so severe and it's one of the only conditions where a, a human being gets severe pain and is still moving around and dancing around and trying to get some relief by movement all other painful conditions you can imagine whether you break a bone or you have appendicitis you don't move around because the pain gets worse but this is one condition the pain doesn't get worse but uh, by movement, but they, they inherently somehow try to achieve some posture and get some relief. So if you have a severe abdominal pain, which comes and goes, and the patient is uh, not, you know, very, uh, he, he doesn't stay in one place, then you know that he has, has a ureteric colic. The other presentation is hematuria. There are a lot of causes of hematuria. Uh, urinary stones is a common cause. Stones, as they come down the ureter and get stuck near the bladder, sometimes you get rare symptoms where the patient complains of pain in the tip of the penis or in the testicle. This is called referred pain. And I don't need to explain to you what referred pain is. You know, when you get ischemic heart disease, you feel pain in the shoulder and in, in the neck. In the same way, when you have a VUJ stone, patient complains of tip of penis and scrotal pain. Once the stone passes into the bladder, you get a few more symptoms where they say they have bladder pain on movement. When they go in a three-wheeler, when they go in a bus, when they go on a bicycle, when, when there is movement, they get severe pain in over the bladder and at the tip of the penis. And sometimes this stone goes and blocks the uh, bladder neck and gives you urine retention. So these are some of the common symptoms that you should know. When you have a stone, nine out of 10 times, the urine shows some red cells. You don't need actually urine culture if there's no signs of sepsis. It's important that you do a, a kidney function because as I told you, we need to know whether this is having any effect on, on uh, renal function. White cell count CRP again is of uh, indicators of severity of uh, sepsis. So it's not directly important. What's important is the urine, the renal function and some kind of imaging. Now let's talk a little about that. When we talk about X-rays, they are the common, the most commonly used test because it's the easiest to get. And as I told you, except uric acid and cysteine stones, all other stones are radio opaque. It shows on X-rays. If you on MCQ, sometimes they'll put a statistic. Remember, seventy to eighty percent are shown. About 20% are not shown on x-rays. They are radio 
loosened and they're usually cysteine or uh, uric acid stones. As opposed to that, it's, I'm going to talk about CT scanning, although it's expensive and it is not that easily uh, obtained in a busy government hospital. CT scans are 100% accurate for stones, irrespective of the type, size, or location. Except, I told you, the Indenavir stone, which uh, examiners are fond of making MCQs out of that. So that's out of the way. Let's talk about ultrasound. Ultrasound is very good at diagnosing kidney stones that are more than two to three millimeters in size. If it's smaller, it doesn't show. So it is helpful, particularly in pregnant people. As you know, you can't use x-rays, you can't use CTs. So it, there's an important role there. And in uh, pediatric practice, you can see all kidney stones when they are bigger than two to three millimeters. You can see some ureteric stones, but you may miss ureteric stones on ultrasound. You can see all bladder stones uh, on ultrasound. So once you've done a urine, kidney function, and any one of these imaging, you should have diagnosed the illness that he has stone disease. So now, what do we do? Sir, can the I most ask important... a question? Yes, yes. Sir, Please stop it. Here. Yes. Yeah. Sir, the, the one common thing that we see in the daily casualties, in the surgical casualties, when we yeah. go in the morning for the casualty ward round, the house of the consentel, there's a patient with a clinically um, uteric uh, colic, and they have done a X-ray KUB. <laughs> So there's nothing to see in the X-ray KUB because of all these, what we see is uh, bowel right. shadows with uh, feces. So That's what, right. what is the sensitivity of uh, X-ray KUB, in a, especially when it is unprepared bowel? Yeah, when it's, when it's, when unprepared bowel and you use an X-ray, if you are looking at ureteric stones, now if, if the patient came to casualty, chances are he's in pain. And that means the stone is in the ureter. And ureteric stones, it is not very accurate, maybe 10, 20%, unless you really clear the bubbles. The problem is they come in the night, you need a diagnosis, and the only thing you can organize quickly is an X-ray, so you do an X-ray. But if you really want to improve the sensitivity, on the left side, you can clear the colon in one day. So give three Dalcolax tablets, let them have a good motion in the morning and take the x-ray fasting. But if the pain is on the right side, usually one day is not enough, as you know. You, you need at least two days of uh, yes, Dalcolax and, and then in, you know, try, and, try and see the stone uh, along the transverse processes, you'll, you'll see it, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you, sir. So once, once you... Uh, made the diagnosis of a ureteric colic. The most important thing for the patient is the pain. And the pain, there's only two, 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 two methodologies. One is a suppository, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the NSAID, the commonly used diclofenac sodium. You can, it comes in 50s and 100s. You can use a suppository and it takes about 15 to 20 minutes and usually it works very well. The problem, like any other medication, remember, he, 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 can, he should not use it if he's uh, allergic, obviously. So don't just use it without that history. Uh, allergy, asthmatics may get worse. And if, if the patient is in uh, chronic renal failure, uh, the nephrologists don't like because it interferes with the chromatoglobin filtration rate. So in the acute setting, the best thing is in an emergency setting, use morphine derivative, either pethidine or morphine. That will sort it out. But sometimes you don't have those, you're, you're in a GP practice somewhere else, your own. And in that situation, if there's no contraindication, use uh, uh, diclofenac sodium suppositories. Uh, 
uh, maximum dose is up to 150 milligrams per 24 hours. So you can use up to about three of them and uh, for 24 hours and, and uh, you, you can then get the pain under control. Once you've got the pain under control, then you can actually uh, go about imaging them with x-rays. As I told you, you might have to clear the bubbles, do a CT, do ultrasound, all those things take time. Then comes the important thing, the pain comes in ureteric colic because of distension. So excess fluid, when you have ureteric colic is wrong advice when you have a colic because your distension is more. So don't ask them to take extra fluid at that time. The important thing is to try and get the block out of the way. And you do that by adding a alpha blocker that is commonly tamsulosin, right? A, a word about tamsulosin, remember, it works better for the lower urethra. I, these statistics are not important, but if I, I just need to show this to you, that the, the, the success rate of uh, stones when they're in the upper urethra passing spontaneously is only roughly 50%. When it comes down to the lower end near the bladder, about 75% pass. So the location matters. Next is the size. If a, if a stone is about four millimeters, 75 to 80% chance it will go. When it increases only to seven millimeters, so from four to seven, it drops to 60%. And if it's about eight millimeters, it's about 39 to 40%. So the important thing is not the statistic. The important thing is bigger the stone, in the ureter, less likely that it'll go out. Higher the stone in the ureter, less likely that it'll go out. And we may have to do things. And the things we do are shockwave lithotripsy and ureteroscopy. We'll, we'll discuss that uh, in a while, right? Yeah. Any, yeah. any, any students have any questions up to now from what Srinsa describes uh, the etiology of the stones, the the composition, the chemical composition, and uh, how they present clinically. And uh, can I sir, ask uh, about the, what are the risk factors uh, to develop any risk factors that identify yes. the risk factors for this? Yes, so the, yeah, the risk factors are, as I told you, all, all things that will interfere with the supersaturation. So if you can take one thing is, Anything in the blood, in the serum, high levels, right? From hypercalcemia, right? To hyperuracemia, out. Uh, any, any chemical, the, the list is very long, right? Any of those uh, metabolic conditions where you have high solute, it'll happen. Then dehydration is a big risk factor. And the other thing is anatomical abnormalities, PUJ obstruction, uh, polycystic kidneys, anywhere there is stagnation of urine that helps precipitation. And then you get stones forming. So, yeah, and these patients who are bedridden uh, bed for a long time, right. they get better stones. That's uh, right. For, yeah. yeah. Most and, uh, paraplegic patients, right? Uh, again, you know the, the the stasis is the is the cause there. It's... Yeah. What about during infections? A recurrent during infection does it predispose yes. to stone formation yes. or the vice versa? Yes, the recurrent urine infection precipitate. There, there are two ways it does it. One way is that you, you get the debris after urine infection, the white cells, the pus, pus cells, and whatever other debris act as a nidus. And as I told you, the supersaturated solution, you add a nidus into that, it precipitates. That's one, one way recurrent urine infections form stones. The other thing is uh, certain bacteria like Klebsiella, when, you, when those bacteria cause urine infection, they alkalinize the urine and thereby precipitate phosphate. And then you get your triple phosphate stone, the true white stone. So yes, infections 
do it in two ways by providing a nidus for the precipitation or changing the pH. Okay, uh, students, do you have any questions uh, up to now from what he has discussed? So this is a good opportunity for you to clarify your any any queries. And anybody want to ask anything at this point? Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sir, uh, uh, if uh, we, uh, if someone says that the X-ray is a very sensitive modality to diagnose acute uh, renal calculi, can we say it's true uh, or uh, as in in a emergency uh, in a casualty setup, sir? In a in a kidney kidney stone. Uh, oh. Yes, kidney or urethral uh, yeah. calculi. I mean, theoretically speaking, the answer should be yes because. Statistically, you have to say 70 to 80 percent can be picked up. So, is it sensitive? You have to say yes, right? But practically, so from an MCQ point of view, say yes, because whoever is testing that will be trying to ask you that. But if the bubble is not full of gas and, and stool, then it's very hard to an untrained eye. I mean, we can pick it up because we are urologists seeing all these bad x rays all the time, we can pick it up, but. Uh, mo most others find it difficult. <clears throat> but the answer to your question, I would say, if someone says, is it a sensitive thing? I, I would say yes. I can't say no. I can't say no. Okay, thank you. Yes, there's yes, another sir. question uh, come up in the chat uh, asking whether there are any contraindications for medical expi expulsion therapy. Expul oh, yes. This is, a, this is a big topic. Yeah. Med any therapy, when we think of stones, what first thing is it must not be an infected system. If a patient has a ureteric colic and he has fever, straight away medical management, shockwave lithotripsy, all of that is out. You should not be giving antibiotics and waiting for a stone to go. Urine infection and a stone uh, is a, actually a surgical emergency and you have to deal with it by draining the obstructed kidney. If there is a ureteric stone and the patient gets fever, you have to, as a matter of urgency, 24, 48 hours, you have to unblock that kidney. That doesn't mean you remove the stone. You can put a percutaneous nephrostomy through the skin, drain it, or put in a double J stent. We don't go and break stones and try to remove stones in an infected system. So ureteric colic, uncomplicated, only can you manage with what we were talking. You should not be managing it if it's infected. You should not be managing pushing medicines if the kidney fun uh, renal function is abnormal. As I told you that the few things you need when you when a patient comes with a ureteric colic is to diagnose, do a urine, you see red cells, colic, you have the answer. Then you must look at the serum creatinine. If the creatinine is high, you have to quickly image this with whatever facility you have and unblock that system, even if there's no fever, because your kidney function takes priority. So in that situation, the two common things, infection and obstruction, uh, don't uh, be giving uh, tamsulosin and Voltar in suppositories, or some people make the mistake of giving antibiotics and waiting. That, that's, that's, that's wrong because you, you damage kidney function for good. You, uh, it doesn't recover from that. How, how do you determine whether the system is obstructed? Now, when we commonly do ultrasound scan, what we see is uh, they say it's mild to moderate hydronephrosis. That's the common picture that we get. Yes. So yeah. do you need now, to train that when it is mild to moderate hydronephrosis or it's uh, severe hydronephrosis? Or is it yeah. If there is severe hydros, hydronephrosis, there's no question you have to take that as a, a, a priority to unobstructive. That's okay. a priority. Mild to moderate is a little more difficult, but in our practice, what we do is we'll, we repeat the creatinine 
when the patient comes in and we also repeat it in about a week's time and see what's happening. If there is any doubt, we go in and unblock him before it gets infected or whatever. Usually with a ureteroscope, uh, non it's sort of mildly invasive, uh, but uh, no real cuts. We go in with the endoscope and, and remove the stone. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned, I don't know whether the students grasp it. So in the obstructive system, it's a, a urological emergency, when it's, especially when it is infected. So you drain it with a nephrostomy over the, to the skin percutaneously, or you put That's a right. double, double jet uh, to yeah. drain it to the bladder. That's right. right. Yes. And uh, encourage the normal passage. Uh, any more yeah. questions? Yes, sir. You want to add anything? Hello, sir. Yeah, yes. Go on. Yes. Uh, sir, what is the place for intravenous urography in uh, stones? Yes. The question is, is there a place for intravenous urography in stones? Yes. It was one of the main ways we uh, uh, sort of investigated stones previously. Now, it's a very good test, but there are a few problems. One, no one will do, give you contrast without having a kidney function test. So at least a blood urea creatinine you need to have. If that's abnormal, you can't give the, you know, uh, IV intravenous urogram is contrast. So you can't give contrast if the kidney function is abnormal. So it's a big limitation there. Plus, you really have to clear the bubbles to get a good picture. So because of that, its, it's use is becoming uh, not that uh, frequent. And our government hospitals today have the CT scans in a lot of uh, hospitals. Almost every general hospital has it. So CT scan is becoming more popular. But the answer to your question, can we use it? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. The problem is that the delay that is going to come. Uh, I, I, hope, I hope you won't get too upset, but I have to say now, when you get a, when you go to book an IVU, no radiology department will ever give you a date as a junior doctor. If you go and say, I want to do an IVU on this patient, they're going to ask you for an ultrasound first. They say, did you do an ultrasound? No. Then do an ultrasound first. Now see the delay, you have to do an ultrasound and then do all of this. So this is where the problem comes, but otherwise it's a very good test. Simply speaking, very good because it opacifies the collecting system very well. And to, to, to diagnose an obstruction, it is brilliant because you see the dye coming down the ureter to a point and it won't go below that. So superb test, but these are the practical problems when you go to use it in a uh, national health system, uh, you know, we, are, we, are, we, we have to adapt to the, the resources that we have. So CT uh, is actually becoming easier to do than an IVU because of these, these problems. Okay, any more questions? So otherwise we can proceed with the... Uh... So, sir, excluding yeah. the limitations and the preparation and the delay, can we say the IV urogram will be the better investigation than the CT? No. 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 Don't say that. That's not correct. Because the, C, the IVU is not going to be better. If you, for example, have a radiolucent stone, right? Your dye will go down the ureter and get stuck at some point. It won't show it. It won't show the stone. So you need to know the length, breadth, how hard the stone is. All of that is, is you're going to miss on an IVU. So the CT is much better uh, test. And you don't use contrast. Remember that we are getting all this information without, uh, without really using contrast. So IVU is not superior to the CT. That, that's 100% that, that's sure. But uh, practically, when you go to use it, I have to say, in a clinical scenario, if there is no CT, there's no point chasing after CT, then we have to manage with, with, the, with the IVU. The IVU 
is slightly superior at diagnosing with confidence obstruction. It will tell that better than the CT, better than most other tests, right? Because your excretion is delayed, then the excretion takes a long time and it comes down the ureter up to a point and stops. So if, you're, if you ask me, is it better to diagnose obstruction? The answer is yes, it is better. But if you have a urinary stone and you want to, what is the best test? It's a non-contrast non -contrast CT. So what okay, is the so place of flexible ureteroscopy in diagnosing stones? Right. Flexible ureteroscope and all other scopes are not used for diagnosis. Right? Why? Because you need to give an anesthetic to the patient to use an endoscope. Flexible ureteroscopes, the semi-rigid ureteroscopes, all of those so it's not a diagnostic tool. You don't need uh, to give a patient an anesthetic, then push a uh, uh, instrument through his penis or lady through the urethra into the bladder, up the, up the urethra, all of that, when you can simply diagnose it with a CT scan. So flexible ureteroscopes is a, is a, is an is a instrument used for therapeutic purposes, not for diagnosis. So flexible ureteroscopes are used for dealing with small stones in the kidney, in the renal, calicial, necks, calices, like that, small sto stones. You use a flexible ureteroscope, which can bend and go right up to the stone and laser using laser energy. You, you can't use uh, any mechanical energy there. You use laser energy and, and blast the stone and powder it. Okay, so I think we can go back to your presentation. Okay, so when we think of, now that we are on, we are talking about intervention of stones. We told you medical management means it's a, not an obstructed system, not an infected system, right? If that is there, we drain it. Now we'll, we'll assume that we have situation where they, those two are not there. Then what are the methods? Like anything in surgical practice, you use non-invasive methods first. You try and do simple things first. So what is the simplest way of breaking up a stone is shockwave lithotripsy. For shortened form, it is ESWL. E stands for extracorporeal. That is giving shock waves from outside the body. Extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy. I just got a little uh, slide here. I'll try and show this to you. Yeah. So a shock wave, first of all, very quickly, is a massively positive pressure wave lasting a millisecond followed by a massive negative pressure. So you get a positive pressure pushing stones together. Next millisecond, it is pulling it apart. The best example, I don't know whether you all have lived through the LTT troubles. When the, when the bombs used to go, glass used to shatter, kilometers away. Now, nothing physically like a stone or a pellet or anything went and blasted that glass. What happened was that the pressure, the shock wave hit the glass. What happened? The positive pressure bent the glass in one way. In a millisecond, the glass is bent the other way. The glass cracks. So the same thing actually happens in the stone. When the shock wave hits the stone, it compresses it. Next millisecond, it pulls it apart. When this happens, you know stones are not uh, sort of uniform. They have little air, uh, weak areas, little cracks. When you keep doing that, the stone breaks into pieces, right? Sometimes you have to use many shock waves, thousands, two thousands. 
So that is the principle that you just need to know. It's a pressure wave called shock wave that breaks the stone. The mechanism, you don't really don't need to know too much. There's a machine with a shock wave generator and a, and a parabolic mirror uh, uh, that focuses it to a focal point. And in the machine, there's a way that we can focus this shock wave to the stone. And it is done under local anesthesia, a little bit of pethidine if it's painful, uh, but no anesthesia, it's an outpatient procedure. This is found in Colombo uh, Hospital, Gaul, Candy, and uh, I think one in uh, Batiklo, and another one is being installed. I don't know whether it's already installed in Colombo South. So this is a common thing that we use to break stones that are not infected and either not obstructed, right? Obviously, if it's obstructed, where will the pieces come? How will the pieces go? When you break the stone, the stone pieces have to go down the ureter, get into the bladder and pass it with the urine through the external meatus. So you can't have an obstruction if you're doing this and you obviously can't do it if there's infection. So this is a common method that we use to break small stones. You don't need the sizes and all. There are limitations, big stones we don't break. The next modality is now we have to come to intervention, surgical intervention. When you have small so stones in the kidney. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, one thing on ESWL. So does the density of the stone uh, is a determinant for ESWL or what do you, so okay. that's first question. The second question is, so you said you can break the stone into small pieces and uh, can the patient experience a uterine colic after that because this is a renal yes. pelvic stone and yes. the smaller stones when they are passing down the ureter cause any symptoms or what are we going to do about it? Are we uh, going doing any yes. intervention? Yes, that's a very good question. So you break the stone and then you have to tell the patient that the pieces are going to go down the ureter and you can get ureteric colics. So what do you do? The same thing as you did before. You give the patient a alpha-1 blocker, tamsulosin, to try and relax the muscle of the, blood, uh, the ureter. And he's also given pain uh, diclofenac sodium suppositories and asked to use that if he gets severe pain. And if, if, if he gets recurrent pain, then of course we have to go in with a ureteroscope and pull the small pieces out of the ureter because sometimes uh, the stones uh, can obstruct the ureter in certain narrow areas, anatomical areas, we, VU junction at the PU junction uh, and, and cause a lot of pain. So if it doesn't help, the medical management, if the medical management doesn't help, then of course we have to go in with uh, surgical options where we go in with a ureteroscope, like the other, what the student told us, flexible ureteroscopes, we have semi-rigid ureteroscopes, but these are all anas under anesthesia. Straight away, theater, it's a surgical procedure and pull the pieces out. So I am Pinto here. Yes. Uh, can we use ESWL uh, for all the stones which are in the ureter or is it only the upper ureter? No, you can use it for all. It's just that the lower ureter, once you start using it, you, you tend to hit the bladder and other areas and it's a little more painful to the patient. But the answer is, can you use it? Yes, you can. It's, right. it, it can be used from the upper to lower. Middle, it's a little difficult because of the uh, sacroiliac joint, the ureter goes over that and it's a little difficult. It's very painful because it hits the bone as well. Right. right. So lower ureter you can use, upper ureter. But most of the surgeons, or if you come to any urologist, when they see a stone that is giving symptoms in the lower ureter, they will say, what is the use of breaking this with shockwave? Just give me a ureteroscope. Yeah, and just put the ureteroscope and pull the stone out. Right. But upper ureter, we won't do it because it's more, more demanding. There's a chance that we'll damage the ureter. So for that reason, 
ESW is very popular for the upper ureter. But as it starts coming down, we can use it and it's, it is as, as, as effective. But the problem is that uh, there, there are more sort of uh, easier and better methods of dealing with when it comes down in the lower ureter. Right. So what about the, um, the, the determinant of the density of the uh, calculizer? Because I think some time back, uh, yes. this was asked in the MCQs in the undergraduate uh, MBBS paper uh, yes. about the Hounsfield units and, uh, so you... and brief on that. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. Okay. So you can see the depth. That's, that's a very advanced question for a undergraduate but uh, let me let me get this out of the way now when you use CT yes. scans water uh, and air right is 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 given a very low Hounsfield number right and harder the substance higher the number just remember that first okay air water almost zero whereas when you go to the higher uh, end of a hard stone, it can be even 1,500. Right, now, for your practical purposes, just remember, stones less than 1,000 Hounsfield, 1,000 HU, Hounsfield number, right? That is a measure of radiological density of something. That's a radiological uh, unit. So Hounsfield number assesses how dense radiologically a substances. So stones which are less than 1,000 Hounsfield number are easy to break. Easy to break, shockwave lithotripsy gives good results. So Hounsfield number more than 1,000, we'll say 1,200, 300, 400, those stones usually don't do well when you use shockwave lithotripsy. Now, Hounsfield number to get, you have to use a CT scan. That's why I said it's, it's, it's the better test to do. If you do a, C, if you do a CT or an X-ray, you, you don't get a Hounsfield number. So then you don't know whether you should be breaking this using shockwaves. So if you do a CT and it's less than, we say it's 800, 900, you know for sure it'll break. If it's 1,400, you know it won't. So just remember those values. Just remember 1,000 as a, as, a, as a border. Less than 1,000, good results with shockwave. More than 1,000, less. The stones, if they ask what are the stones, particularly uric acid stones, are less than 1,000. Whereas the calcium oxalate, calcium monohydrate, those stones are hard and the, the Hounsfield numbers are uh, closing upon 1,500 Hounsfield. Okay, sir. I think we can proceed. Okay, so after that, it's a little bit of surgical input for you. So you have stones in the kidney, you have stones in the ureter, you have stones in the bladder. Now, what do we do? Small stones in the kidney, shockwave lithotripsy. Bigger stones, surgical or earlier method was pyelolithotomy. You must know that term. And nephrolithotomy, pyelolithotomy. Lithotomy is cutting for stone. So pyelo means if the stone is in the renal pelvis, cut the, you, it's an open surgical procedure. Anesthesia, cut through the skin, go up to the kidney, open the renal pelvis, pull the stone out. That's called pyelolithotomy. Nephrolithotomy is where you remove the stone from the renal cortex. So you cut the renal cortex. It's a very bloody operation. You pull the stone out and then you have to use big mattress sutures to get hemostasis. Now, today, very few people in Sri Lanka do this operation. It's entirely done through an endoscope. It's actually, I shouldn't say it's endoscope. It's percutaneous. You make a little cut in the skin using x-rays. You use you pass a telescope into the kidney and break the stone and pull the pieces out 
through a little sheet, right? The technical uh, aspects, I don't think no one's going to ask you, but remember it's called percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Nephro, why? Because you go through the renal cortex, skin, make a cut, push the telescope under X-ray guidance into the lower pole of the kidney, and you're going through the renal cortex and doing what you're doing. So that's why the name percutaneous nephrolithotomy. So that is the more modern way of doing uh, stone surgery in the kidney. Any size of stone, any type of stone, any size, any, any, any type, any size can be managed with percutaneous nephrolithotomy, PCN or PCNL. You can also use a flexible ureteroscope and a laser. Those are used for smaller stones, uh, like we'll say nine millimeter, 10 millimeter stones. If it's anything bigger than 10, 12, um, throughout the world, if it's at least 15 millimeter stones, you go with the percutaneous method. Then once you have the ureteric stones, I told you in the upper ureter, we try to use shockwave lithotripsy. But if it's in the middle or lower, you give an anesthetic and pass a very fine instrument, a telescope, which is only about two millimeters thick. It's very thin. And you go in with that instrument into the ureteroscope, into the ureter, and then use a laser and break the stone without damaging the ureter and virtually powder it and come out. Sometimes when you do this, you have to leave a thing called a double J stent. That is a little piece of rubber, which is curved in both ends. You insert it from the bladder into the kidney. And when it goes into the kidney, the renal pelvis, there's room. So it curls the top end and the bottom end curls in the bladder. Just know that because if they're asking Hounsfield numbers from you, they're going to also at some point ask you about a JJ Sten, the, the internet is full of pictures. I'm sorry, I don't have one to, to show it to you today. Uh, if we are doing some other lectures, I'll, I'll show you some uh, little videos on, on doing a ureteroscopy or a, a percutaneous nephrolithotomy later. The, so ureteric stones, ureteroscopy, kidney stones, ESWL, ureteroscopy, or at, in the modern world, percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Bladder stones are dealt with by uh, like an instrument called lithotrite, but what it is is a cystoscope. It's a telescope which goes in the reverse direction of the urine flow, external urethral meatus. It goes in and then under vision, you break the stone and pull it out through the uh, urethra. So these are the surgical options for uh, dealing with, with stones. Any, any questions on that? Uh, sir, does lithotide available in the government hospitals? Yes, it's available. Now we, we have more than uh, altogether about 40 urologists, but we are very well equipped Western province is very well equipped. Uh, we have it in Gaul, we have it in Hambantota, we have it in Eastern province, Kurunagala. Uh, so yes, it is available. Everything I told you today is available in the government hospitals. We, uh, the urology uh, care and, and technology has, has improved remarkably. So what I'm talking about is not based on uh, expensive private hospital care. This care is given to our national health, health ministry patients. Sometimes it's, there's a waiting list for it, but I am proud to say that no urologist today does a pyelolithotomy or nephrolithotomy. No one does a ureterolithotomy. They will go using the instruments. Yes, there's a waiting list, but it will happen. Down south, going along, Colombo, 
Kalutar, Gaul, Matar, Hambantata, all those units have these instruments. They have the CTs, they have the lasers, they have the whole works. Unfortunately, like most things, we are overwhelmed. We have more patience than time to operate. That is that is the problem. We are actually trying to address that problem. Also, we, soon I'll, I'll be very happy to note that it will be done close to your faculty. We, we are getting a place organized where free, free, entirely free patients, it will be a stone center where patients can be referred from all over the country and they will have their operations done the modern way without any uh, fees being charged. So that's my, uh, I'm involved in that project. Hopefully we'll get it going soon. That's great news, sir, to hear. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question, sir? Uh, now we see yes. now, you, you say there are more patients than the operating time we have. Uh, some yes. patients tend to have recurrent stone disease. Yes. So how do you address this problem? Are they having the same old risk factor that is pedospheres in them or is there a genetic composition for this? Yeah. The answer to that is yes, that both are working. Commonly, the more, more, more common thing is a genetic factor. Most recurrent stone formers have, when you analyze their urine, what happens is the, the, the way we answer this is when a patient develops a stone or the second time they develop a stone, we analyze the stone, chemical analysis of the stone using X-rays, uh, spe special spectrometry, and uh, you, you can get the crystal. This is not saying it has 10% calcium, it has 20% oxalate. It's not that. It's, what is the crystal? Is it calcium oxalate, monohydrate, dihydrate? Like that, we can find that out. We also use a 24-hour urine collection and see what is wrong with this patient's urine, what we call lithogenic urine. I commonly found problem, as I told you, is that their citrate is lacking or they have hypercalciuria with normal calcium in the blood. Their urine calcium levels are high and their citrate concentration is low. And the reason for this, yes, it is genetic. It's not really the diet. But by hydrating excessively, when it's excessively two, two to three liters, nothing beyond that, if you hydrate to that level, you can overcome this problem. But there has to be a lot of uh, encouragement to the patient to keep doing it because if he doesn't do it, you can be sure he, he forms uh, calcium oxalate stones. When it comes to uric acid stones, it forms because the urine is, I told you, acidic, very acidic, and they form. So to do that, or to, to prevent them from getting another stone, we have to alkalinize the urine. If you take a lot of water, anything up to three liters, the urine pH goes up. Adding simple potassium citrate helps. So those two things we do commonly and alkalinize the urine and stop them from developing uric acid stones. So in summary, yes, it is mostly genetic that the recurrent stone is formed, but lifestyle modification by adding more citrate to the diet, adding more water to the diet, you can prevent it from happening. Okay, so now for the exam purposes for the uh, undergraduates, uh, if they have a patient with uh, recurrent stones and if the examiner asks, uh, would you do a spectrometry to analyze the stones? And I mean, our students doesn't know whether it's been done even in, in, in Sri Lanka. Do we have facilities to do this? Yes, yes, we, we do have facilities. Uh, MRI does it for us. The, the important thing, if, if at an exam, if they ask you, you concentrate on, on what is easily, build your answer up. Do a serum calcium, right? Check whether a lot of patients come to us with uric acid stones, they don't know their diabetics. So do the sugar, do the random blood sugar or fasting sugar, exclude diabetes, 
check for hypercalcemia. Do that. And then say, I'll get the stone analyzed. And the 24-hour urine collection can be done. I don't know whether it's done in, in uh, the Ragama hospital, but it's it, it, the easiest place is the Medical Research Institute. They do a good job. So yes, it can be done. Can be done. And 24-hour urine will give most of the answers that we are looking for to stop the stone from coming back we need to know what the problem is and the problem will be seen in the urine and uh, 24 hour urine collection is very helpful to identify the cause but i have to say whatever the cause finally what we have to do is to increase the hydration and alkalinize the urine the bottom line becomes that so some people say, why go through the uh, hassle of collecting all this urine and doing all of this when this is the thing. But from the exam point of view, assess the stone, chemical composition of the stone and 24-hour urine to get an idea why this patient is getting recurrent stones. But you'll be surprised that it's not a common thing, but quite a few of them have hypercalcemia, right? So you must... First, rule that easy thing out rather than collecting urine for 24 hours. You just you just do a serum calcium and if that is high, you know he's got parathyroid or some issue there and, and then we have to sort that out. Right, good. So other thing is uh, that when we check a routine UFR, sometimes these are the patients who are not having any uterine colic or any history of stone disease. Uh, we yes. see there's a trace of uh, calcium oxalate crystals in the yes. UFR. It, what, what should we do about this? Do we need to uh, track, uh, I mean, do any further investigations to find out whether they have any stone disease or no. we no. can just Cal ignore it? Calcium oxalate, uh, finding calcium oxalate crystals is normal, 100% normal. It's a normal finding. It just means he didn't have enough water and he, he formed the crystals. If you analyze all of them, even you're, you're going to find very few who will have stones. But if you have uric acid calculi, that is clearly abnormal. There's no question, okay. right? Finding calcium oxalate, is it an abnormal finding? The answer is no, it is a normal finding. Finding uric acid crystals, is, is it an abnormal finding? Yes, that means there's a problem. Either he has hyperuricemia or hyper um, uremia. So there's there's increased uric acid in the urine or there's increased uric acid in the blood. So having uric acid crystals is completely abnormal. If, if someone gives that as an MCQ, you have to say calcium oxalate is, is a normal finding. Okay. The other question is what is the place for antibiotics? Does it play any role or is it obsolete? No. In, stone yeah. disease? In, in stone disease, antibiotics actually, except in, we'll say there's a, there's a, in, in a very few limited places, antibiotic use is obsolete and should not be used. Why? Because you mask infection. As I told you, stones and infection means we have to go and deal with it fast unblock and then treat. So giving antibiotics to a stone patient, firstly, if he doesn't have fever is a wrong thing to do. Why you won't see when the patient gets fever. If you get, if you see fever, you know, you straight away change your management. You quickly look for obstruction, unobstruct him, then treat with antibiotics. And as a second stage only, will you deal with the stone? So antibiotics have very little role in, in dealing with urinary stones. There are few situations where you might use it in, in paraplegic patients, in, in certain situations you might use it. But where, for example, we'll say there is a, there's an anatomical defect that we can for whatever reason uh, correct. Then you know recurrent urine infection gives 
the patient stones. So you might keep on a low dose prophylactic antibiotic, but I have to say that is the exception to the rule. Don't even remember that. Stones and uh, infection uh, means you must treat the infection and, 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 and not mask it by using. There's a question uh, coming up in the chat uh, asking uh, the management of the staghorn calculi, uh, when, to do, when to consider intervention and uh, whether we can observe or follow a patient who is asymptomatic or not affecting the creatinines. Yes. Uh, yes. This, this, the answer to this has been done through some research where they have followed up patients who have staghorns and who have no, no overt infection. The patient is not febrile. Uh, he has no symptoms. And when you follow them over many years, due to the pressure of the weight of the, the, the stone and low grade infection, although it doesn't appear like fever, the, the, kidney function actually goes down very gradually. So the answer to that is, if you see a staghorn, can we uh, not, uh, is there a place for non-operation? No. If the patient is unfit, that's different. But uh, for whatever reason, if he's unfit for surgery, yes, then we have no other choice. But otherwise, if you see a staghorn stone, that stone has to be removed. And uh, yeah. Yeah. can be removed today with a percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Sometimes you have to make more than one puncture into the kidney at the same time. You make dual tracks or triple tracks and clear the stone out. Yeah, yeah you, uh, we have seen some patients uh, past few years uh, who are coming, all patients with non-functioning kidneys and who yes. when done the investigations to find out they have a large stack gone calculi sitting in the pelvis. So, yes, it does affect uh, the renal functions, as Surensa says, and they will uh, eventually end up with a uh, non functioning kidney if you don't treat it. So, stack gone calculus, yes, it needs uh, surgical management unless the patient is quite unfit to undergo surgery, any form of surgery. Uh, is there what, any limitation for the ESW with regard yes. to the size of the yes. calculus? We spoke any... about the hardness of the uh, calculus, and that is we use usually use the magic figure of thousand ounce wheel. Less than thousand only do we do. Yeah. The the size of the stone has been gradually coming down over the years. Ten years ago. The guidelines told us even two centimeter stones to break and not break bigger than two. But the modern 2020 guideline tells us stick to about 1.5 centimeter. The reason being you have the bigger the stone, the larger the residual stones you're going to leave behind. And shockwave lithotripsy also has a certain damage to the kidney and if we have to use it repeatedly, uh, then the kidney actually gets fairly significantly damaged by the shock waves. So for that reason, they say percutaneous nephrolithotomy is, is preferred for stones bigger than 1.5 centimeter, if you really want the figure. And if it's less than 1.5 centimeter, go for shockwave lithotripsy. Okay, you said that the ESW has an impact on the uh, kidney damage as well. So, are we looking at a, is there any figure to say you can't uh, give ESW beyond two times, three times, anything like that? Yes. Or do you, do you measure the creatinine in the real functions and decide? No, no. The common sort of rule of thumb is you do not use shockwave lithotripsy beyond three times to a kidney. The okay. reason being they have seen, they didn't know earlier when they kept using it, nothing seriously happened at the beginning, but with a few, in a few years time, the ki kidney shrinks, the cortex really shrinks and you, you end up with a, a very small amount of cortex left behind and, and you go into renal failure early. So you don't use ESW beyond about three times today. 
Right. So does it, uh, I mean, uh, initiate uh, fibrotic pathology? Or, I mean, uh, to shrink they the feel that, yes, they feel repeated shockwave lithotripsy. They feel because it's such a generalized thing now, you hit only, we'll say, the lower pole three, four times, yeah. but the whole kidney shrinks. So they feel it is interfering with the blood supply, probably right. cause thrombosis or some, they, they feel it's vascular because the whole kidney shrinks. It's not the location that you gave the shock. It's the whole kidney that shrinks. Okay, okay. Uh, so that's another question. I mean, any, any students want to uh, ask directly from Surin, sir? rather than putting them in the chat. Uh, sir, is there any indication to perform vesicolithotomy over lithotripe? Okay. And the question is, is there a particular indication for doing vesicolithotomy over uh, endoscopic methods? Yes. Now, sometimes you, you get a stone uh, about, we'll say, six inches. It's, it's filling the whole bladder. Now, in that situation, we can use a lithotript, uh, right? But it'll, it'll take us hours. And imagine pulling all these little pieces through the penis. If it's a male, a long urethra, we end up damaging the urethra. So when stones are that big, then we have no hesitation in doing an open surgery. We cut open the uh, bladder. So you uh, just above the pubic symphysis, skin incision, nice bikini cut, go in, make a big cut on the uh, bladder, just virtually bivalve it, just completely open it, remove the whole stone without breaking it, just wash it and, and close the bladder in two layers. Remember always, if you open a bladder, you have to leave a catheter for about 10 days. So this is one reason why we don't do it more often because the patient has to hang on with a catheter and no, no male or female likes to have a catheter. So that's one reason why we don't use it that often. But the answer is yes. If you have a large stone, vesicle lithotomy is preferred than endoscopic methods. Good. Any, any, any more questions? Or any, any questions that you have come across in the past papers that you want to clarify? Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, then we consider uh, six or more than six as large stones. Uh, so where, where, where are you talking about? Is it? Uh, sir, the, uh, regarding the You're talking about previous question, sir. So, so do, to okay. do the open bladder surgery. If you're talking about uh, a bladder stone, because we spoke about kidney stones, 1.5 centimeter and uh, larger than that, percutaneous. Bladder stones, you know, the guideline doesn't give a value because it is partly based on the facilities you have the patient preference and all of that. But if you ask me, I wouldn't do a six inch stone uh, with a, with a uh, endoscopic method, but there's no real cutoff mark for a bladder calculus, when to open and when to do it endoscopically. Because as you know, overseas, they do it in two procedures or three procedures rather than cut open because they don't like to go home with a catheter. So because of that, what they do is they go in, break about half the stone, and then send them home, bring them back, break a little bit more like that. So there is no guideline for the bladder stone. No one will ask that. It's an unfair question if they ask you, how, how big should you be to remove a stone? You know, I don't, don't worry about the size. Just know that if it's big, for example, a, a size of an egg, we can take it through the penis or, or the urethra. But uh, if it's about two or three egg size, no way, no way. You, you can, at the, at the risk of damaging the urethra and a urethral damage usually results in a urethral stricture, 
which is uh, has to be surgically repaired and it's a very difficult operation to do okay thank you so sir. although i mentioned although i mentioned about 6 inches don't use that as a, as a guideline no right there Sir, what is basket extraction? Right. Basket extraction is uh, when we talk about ureteroscopy, I told you you anesthetize the patient and use a fine endoscope into the bladder, then into the ureter. Now, once you get into the ureter and break stones, you can also use a very tiny basket. It's a, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not prepared with the pictures for you, but it's a, it's a little wire basket, which is kept closed. It's kept closed and, and you insert it through the endoscope under vision. And once it goes past, past the broken fragments, you can open it. And then imagine like a little umbrella, you gently pull that down with the pieces that's what you call a, a, a basket extraction. If, if the stone is very small, you don't have to use laser even. We'll say it's a three millimeter, four millimeter stone. You can entrap it in the basket, lock it in the basket and gently pull it down. So a basket is, a, is an instrument you use through the ureteroscope to entrap small calculi or calculi fragments and remove it through the endoscope and finally through the urethra. Thank you, sir. I think uh, uh, Nalinda, we might uh, just show them some pictures about the baskets, yeah. double J stems. Uh, you yeah, know, they, they, uh, they, they, yeah, we just, they haven't seen these things because they are yes, not, uh, getting very that's much. Right. Yeah, I think what I'll do is I'll try and get some videos that I've done where we are we are blasting yeah. stone, then using a basket. You can see all of these in action, and we'll we'll show them uh, some videos uh, later on. Yeah, and uh, probably we can fix a uh, to discuss about the prosthetic CA or uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, the management, and yeah. which is very commonly asked. In the undergraduate curriculum. Yes. Uh, yes, we, we can do that. We can do PPH yeah. if you, if you like. We'll first do the benign disease, and then yes. it's easier to handle the, the the cancer of the organ. So yes, yeah. we can do the benign. benign. Yeah. And if they have any questions, they can then bring it, uh, yeah. bring it to that session, and we can quickly go. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any questions uh, from the discussion today about the stone disease? Sir, one more question, sir. Yes. Uh, yes. Can we dis uh, prevent all kinds of stones with uh, high vitamin C or citrate food fruit intake? Can you Is it applicable to all kinds of stones? Uh, no. No, it's not. It's not applicable to all, but it 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 has a it has a fairly good role in most 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 stones because see if you have hypercalcemia however much of uh, citrate you you take it won't help no you have to deal with that problem like that but most stones calcium stones if you use uh, citrate in high concentration it's an inhibitor it helps prevent. If you use it in high concentration, it also alkalinizes the urine. So uric acid stones also go away. But uh, answer to that, if, if, I, if you have to answer that, I'll say no. It's, it's not a thing that you should be using on, on all patients. No, if you have a struvite infected stones, it has no place. So can I ask a question though? The first thing all the... Um, I mean, the clinical practice, what we do is to ask for a UFR to see red blood cells in, a, in the urine. How sensitive is it? Is it still valid? Yes, it's more than 90% accurate. But particularly if you have a ureteric colic, 
If you have a urethral colic, no use of an X-ray. If you want to make the diagnosis, you have a urethral colic, do a urine FR. If there are red cells, the, diet, the, the, the sensitivity is more than 90% accurate urethric colic. End of story. If there are no red cells, the patient is symptomatic? Yeah. Go always by the symptom. The test doesn't get, uh, unless you're doing a CT scan, any other test yeah. if you do, and the patient has a your clinical suspicion, urethric colic, go with your clinical diagnosis. Urethric colic, yeah. 10% of the time have nothing in the urine, no pus, no red cells. So don't change your diagnosis because of that, because of a negative test. There are some tests which are 100% accurate, like a CT. You do a urethric, you have a patient with a colic pain, you do a CT, no stone, yeah, then nothing to check. He doesn't have a stone. He, he may be having a, a lot of other uh, urethric colic, like maybe a, a radiculopathy, Elderly man may be a leaking aneurysm. There are so many other little, little differentials that we can think of. But the, in those situations, uh, go by the test. But in most clinical scenarios, use your clinical. So patient has a symptom that tells you something. And just because a test says no, doesn't mean it's not there. It is there. That's why the patient is having the symptom. Do a better test. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah, yeah. go on. Uh, sir, uh, in, a, in the context of obstructed or infected uh, uh, scenario, uh, until the percutaneous nephrotomy can be done as a house officer, uh, what are the other steps that we should take uh, uh, yeah. with the patient? Yes, there are two problems when there is an obstructed infected kidney. One is the sepsis that will kill, kill the patient. Right? So the first thing you do is manage the sepsis. Send his urine, send his blood, start IV antibiotics. There's nothing wrong in doing that. What is wrong is to keep doing that. Now you're the house officer, the patient comes in the night. What can you do? You can't do anything except send the urine, send the blood, start, start on IV antibiotics. When, you, when the patient is seen the next day, Urgent ultrasound. If the if your radiology department fusses, go personally and say, I want this ultrasound. And then there is gross hydronephrosis or moderate hydronephrosis. You, uh, your, your, your doctor, your physician, your surgeon, your wherever you, whatever field you're in, they know, bang, this patient has to be dealt with. And either a percutaneous nephrostomy the very next day, or transfer the patient to where it can be done, or a double J stent. No giving antibiotics and delaying, because then the patient might not die, but you kill the kidney. It, the kidney's concentration ability is gone for good. He'll produce urine, which is of a, a standard specific, uh, specific gravity is fixed. It's of no use. It can't concentrate the re, uh, it can't the kidney can't concentrate and you know the most important thing the kidney does is to concentrate and it can't concentrate and that's gone 48 to 72 hours if you sit on an infect obstructed infected kidney it it re, uh, re, uh, the renal function is gone for good so that is a surgical emergency but in your situation treat the sepsis fast There's a question in the chat coming up asking whether we should uh, routinely put a JJ stent following ESWL. Sorry, uh, sorry, I, I, you broke up. I didn't hear the uh, question. Right. So there's a question being asked about ESWL, whether we should put a JJ stent routinely after each and every ESWL. No. no, actually there's enough research to show that double J stents don't make a difference to the final outcome, except that you don't have urethral colics when you have the stent. That's all it does, nothing else. So if you are in a large unit where you are breaking a lot of stones, then you might put in a double J for the sake of avoiding that 
may be 5 10 percent that you will otherwise have to go in and pull the stones out because of that you put in a double j particularly when the stone is big we'll say you have a 1.5 centimeter stone and you want to break it and not really do a pcnl because of workload difficulty to get into theater then you'll put in a stent and break it because otherwise you know for sure the pieces will come down and block can give you give you problem but otherwise eswl results when you talk about stone free rates double j stents don't do anything it doesn't change it at all but practically you might have to use it to to conserve your surgical time so you put in a double j and break it patient is safe no pain no colleagues so then of course you will have to pull the stent out and then you'll have the problem but at least you can wait till you get a uh, uh, a vacant list, an operating slot. So they used it for that reason. But uh, remember, double J stents and ESWL, the results are not improved by it. So for the benefit of the students, can you just, uh, um, uh, I mean, elaborate what the double J stent actually does in the ureter? Because it, it also takes some space in the, the ureteric caliber. So how can it help to prevent the ureteric colic? That's right. Now, as we go back to that question, ureteric colic is because of the obstruction, right? Now, when you put in a, a double J stent, a double J stent is, it has a, uh, the inside of this rubber tube is hollow. It also has holes from outside joining this hollow. So imagine a, a hollow tube which with holes on the surface. The top end and bottom end is curled. It used to be called also a pigtail. You have seen in, in the faculty area, I'm sure you'd have seen enough of uh, pigs and you see the tail, what you call the pigtail. It's, it's a curved, uh, in, in singular, you'll have to say like a kombu. So you, you can't use a, push, uh, put a double J stent like that, obviously. So what you do is you, there is a thing called a guide wire, which you pass into this rubber tube. It, then it straightens out. Then with a cystoscope, you gently pass this into the kidney using x-rays, C arm. Once it goes into the kidney, you pull the wire out. Then the top end curls and the bottom end curls. Now, although this might have taken some space, the curled part is in, in the renal pelvis and the bottom curl part is in the bladder. So any urine getting into those little fenestrations, those holes come along the tube and come out. Another thing happens when you put this double J stent, you know the ureter is a muscular organ and the muscle relaxes and it actually widens temporarily. It, the muscle sort of paralyzes and it becomes wide. Normally there's peristalsis down the ureter. The, when you put in a double J, peristalsis stops and the ureter widens and becomes like a big, big uh, tube. So therefore, although it takes up space, because it relaxes, you get more space and urine drains through it as well. So when you put a double J, you have urine draining through it and around it, remember. The, the actual uh, research shows more goes around it than through it. More go around it because the ureta dilates. Yeah, that's very important what you mentioned because students you need to understand that ureter is just not a conduct not a conduit it's made out of smooth muscle cells and it the, even the urine goes down to the bladder via peristaltic movement so that's why you get forceful contractions in the obstruction uh, forceful that's peristaltic contractions uh, to give rise to the pain uh, any, any more questions? Uh, yes, one student has asked in the chat about whether we are going to take the 
JJ stent uh, out or remove it sometime later? Yes, usually you put that and uh, once you left it for about two or three weeks, the ureter paralyzes and becomes wide. Then most often you can go with a flexible cystoscope, a very tiny instrument like a catheter, <laughs> but with a, with a visual, you, you can see with the light, you go into the bladder, catch the bottom end that is curled, catch that with a forceps, and gently pull the stent out through the urethra. Under local, you can do that. Yes, you have to pull it out. If you leave a stent for too long, it acts as a nidus, I told you, how stones form. In the same way, round the double J, stones form if you leave it for too long. So maximum time you leave depends on the material you use. You can leave special materials up to a year, but for practical purposes, the answer is you remove it as quick as possible. But you can leave one for about two, three months maximum. That's the very standard rubber that we use. Any more questions, students? Okay, sir. So, so then uh, we will wind up the session for today. And I will uh, contact you to have another session okay. because this was very valuable what you mentioned today. And uh, it's, um, uh, we should have another session for this uh, BPH and prosthetic CA. Okay. Because it's okay. another area that is even tested in the undergraduate curriculum. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Special to have you with us today. Okay. Okay. It was really a pleasure. It was lovely teaching them. I'll, I'll look forward to the next one and I'll try okay. and get some videos for them by that time. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Thank nice, you. Sir. Good night.